The Book of Jude may be short in length, but it begins and builds like a bold shout of strength. From a warning about false teachers and apostasy, to contending for the faith with a sense of urgency, Jude's letter seeks to heighten the awareness of believers by drawing upon past biblical imagery as a way to frame their present reality. This admonishment is more than necessary for today, as dividers, dissenters, and deceivers have infiltrated the church and contaminated the truth. Thus, as Jude alludes, one can mark the error of a rebel when they know the truth of the Bible. And that is why the heart of this letter is not just about recognizing the red flags of what is apostate, but it's also an exhortation to contend earnestly to raise the flag of faith. So as we take a serious look into the book of Jude, let us know that these times of aggression against the truth require the same intensity from believers to protect the truth. Packs are now on. I'm live. Welcome to Coastal Christian. Jude, verses 16 to 19 is where we're at. You can open the book and you can look at those verses. I hope you've been following along from the beginning of this study. We are several months into the study of Jude, and I hope verse by verse you're understanding there's two themes really running through. The first would be the believers charged to contend for the faith. The second would be to have spiritual eyes to discern the lies. So if there was a goal in my heart teaching through this book, it would be that you would come to know the truth so well that you can discern the lies of hell. And there are plenty of lies coming from hell nowadays. As the world's spinning, it is evident that the Lord is sifting, the Lord is purifying, the Lord is refining, the Lord is constantly drawing believers back to himself, all of which is grounded and guarded by the truth. So we need to know the truth. The truth is a person, absolutely. Jesus is the embodiment of truth. But he left with us in place his Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, lives within the believer. Well, at the same time, that spirit recognizes truth. And that spirit also is called to be tethered to the word of truth. And to know this book so well, Genesis to Revelation, not just by way of information, that's great, that's grand, not just to have the ability to understand theology, how about the intimacy that comes with knowing the author of this book, spending time with him day by day, desiring to spend your mornings, your days and your nights with him, so as to grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, if we were going to put two books side by side to compare them, or basically what we're seeing in Jude, the acts of the apostates juxtaposed with the acts of the apostles. Okay, that's the book of Acts. We see the workings of God in the early church. Remarkable to see because it really is the history of the church. And somewhere along the way, the history of the church went off the rails. So don't mistake church history after the book of Acts with church biblically. Did you get that? Church history isn't always church biblically. And we've lost sight of the book, of the boundaries of the Bible, of what God has prescribed for the believer. No doubt, when you stand for truth, absolute truth, which the Bible defines, God gives us the guidelines, a moral compass therein. When you stand for truth in a world of lies, this is where persecution comes. So if the world does not prescribe to absolute truth, but a spirit of relativism, so to speak, we're at a place in human history where they will call your truth a lie. They will call what is good, evil, and they will espouse to evil as if it's good. They will believe that a man could be a woman and a woman could be a man. Are you understanding where I'm going with this? So when you stand your ground firmly in that conviction of truth, lifting up the banner of the gospel, lifting up the truth of the gospel, 
which is what saves the soul. It's why Paul, writing to the Romans, understanding that the early church, the believers, some of which were falling away, and he also saw there wasn't this spine that was stiffened to stand against the persecution. So he put pen to parchment and he was like, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God. It's the power of God. What is? The gospel is. The message of the gospel is the power of God to salvage and save the soul. He says, I'm not going to back down from that. I'm not going to cower away from that. While people around me might be compromising, Paul's like, I am going to be unashamed of the name that took away my pain and shame. Do you know this savior I speak of? You've been entrusted with a ministry, a ministry that serves the body, each of us a member in the greater body. Each of us serve a purpose, right? Not any part of the body or member is greater than the other. Some just might be the mouthpiece or the broken vessel that God pours out through and to. Some might serve in different capacities, yet all of us moving in the same direction, unified under what? The gospel, grounded by what? Truth. So persecution is inevitable. To be opposed by the world is a guarantee for the believer. To not be is to question whether or not you are one. To not have pressure coming at you from the non-believing world, family members, friends, coworkers, for standing for truth and talking about Jesus is to actually not take the scripture seriously, which is being introspective, which is testing whether or not you're in the faith. One guarantee that you will learn from the book of Acts, the actions of the early church, the apostles, is that persecution would come. Jesus said it's a guarantee. And based on the fire of persecution coming, they began to spread like wildfire. So the enemy, dealing with them from the outside in, knowing that he could not stop this work of God because every time he tried them from the outside in, they just spread and got more bold on the truth. So what did he do? He goes from the inside out and he sows seeds on the inside and he sends plants on the inside. And that's why the greatest threat to the church and Christian is not physical persecution. The greatest threat to us is spiritual deception. You stand on that truth in a world that is gonna say that you are a bigot, you are a hater, you are a chauvinistic blank, like all of these things that you are called for standing on biblical values, biblical principles, believing in two genders, believing that marriage is confined to a man and a woman, all of these things are going to bring persecution to be expected. Not even to mention how jacked up we are at the highest level in our land, the government just formed and fashioned a new governance board, the Department of Homeland Security, and out of all the things they could have called it, they decided to identify that board as the Ministry of Truth. Now, I don't know much, but I do know one thing. The Ministry of Truth was trusted to the church. So you have a body or a governance board that is the filter and the deciding factor on what is truth. Not concerned about that. I'm gonna to expect to be persecuted from what their standard of truth is because I know it's a lie. Concerned with the body that is entrusted with the ministry of truth, yet some, under the guise of truth, are sowing lies. That's what I'm concerned with. This is the book of Jude. He is charging and challenging the early church to contend earnestly for the faith, the faith that was entrusted to the saints. Remember, we've worked our way through poetry in this book. We've worked our way through theology in this book. We went into the Old Testament, looked at Israel, the angels. We've looked at Korah and Balaam. We looked at Enoch. We've looked at metaphors 
how he compares these apostates to these images. And now when we come to verses 16 to 19, you know what he does? He begins to give us the actions of the apostates. It's a profile yet again. To create a profile of a criminal, there are certain things that go into that profile. And the reason they do that is to prepare maybe the police to be able to identify the criminal. So there's a profile that's put out. This is how Jude is writing. There's a profile that he's about to put out. Beginning in verse 16, here's one symptom of an apostate. These are grumblers and complainers, walking according to their own lusts. They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. All right, back up. These are grumblers and complainers. Both words seemingly are interrelated, but they have a different meaning. Grumbling can be an onomatopoeia because the meaning of the word or the sound of the word lends itself to what is being expressed. Grumbling, rumbling. You're a grumbler. You are murmuring. Like these are ways to describe somebody that might not be totally vocal about their frustrations, but they're grumbling. It's like a steady tone. They're just grumbling their way through life. These types of spiritual liars some way, somehow find themselves grumbling, but then that rolls over always. When you're a grumbler, it rolls over to complaining. Complaining is outward. It's, it's vocal. You can hear a complainer. A complainer, based on the Greek word here, is blame shifting. Mainly others, but also God. I'm complaining about my circumstances, things never going my way, and I'm really mad at God for allowing that lot to touch my life. Grumbling and complaining. This is related to the times of the Israelites being delivered from Egypt when they're making their way through the wilderness and God had done the delivering and the providing in the wilderness and he was even establishing them a promised land. And as they made their way into the wilderness, it says in Exodus 15, Exodus 17, Numbers 14, and it's capstoned in 1 Corinthians 10. One of their sins was not just idolatry. One of their sins was grumbling and complaining. National pastime. It was their national pastime because they were so delusional about what God had done, this spiritual amnesia of sorts, that they had this unhealthy perspective that we would have been better off in Egypt eating cucumbers and fish than here in the wilderness as free men and women. So they turned their emotion heavenward and began to complain. Interestingly, Psalm 106, hundreds of years later, the psalmist, as a way of providing context to that time period, he writes this, Psalm 106, 24 and 25. Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord. Both verses have key phrases. They despised the promised land where the Lord was leading them because they did not believe his word. Did you see that? You can despise what God is doing, where God is taking, when you don't take God at his word. Because what you're seeing isn't lining up with what you think should be afforded to you. Notice the second part of that Psalm, but complained in their tents, in their private dwelling. Okay, nobody's listening to me. This is a private conversation. Whether it's with a spouse or with a, another family member, this is in the confines of my own home. And all the while God's like, I can hear you. I can hear your complaining says they did not heed the voice of the Lord. Now, remarkably, complaining is not grounded in circumstances. A lot of the times we would believe that, right? Based on my circumstances, you know what? That lot in life warrants a complaint. Complaining is not grounded in circumstances. You know where it's grounded? It's grounded in your character. It's where it exists. People can find anything to complain about. Oh, I know. <laughs> Trust me. People will complain about anything. So I have myself a complaint department. Personally, his name is Little John. If you know anything about my story, you can direct all your complaints <laughs> to him. If you don't know who that is, send me a complaint. 
what does the Bible say? Right, if this is a huge deal to God, grumbling and complaining, blame shifting, making excuses, being discontent and dissatisfied, basically saying, God, you don't know what you're doing with my life. In Philippians, Paul would write, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God. What does a child of God look like? Without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Verse 16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul's like transitioning and saying, hold forth the word of life, the word of truth, and do not be like the world and its crooked nature. Here's the thing about complaining. It's like bad breath. You know when it's in somebody else's mouth but you don't recognize it when it's in your own, right? We can hear complaints coming from other people. I'm wondering, do we hear when they come off our tongues? Because if it made its way out my mouth, look at me, it was in my heart. And I wanna be what Paul says, I wanna be a child of God without fault in the midst of those that complain. And no matter what I'm doing, I wanna make sure I'm not doing so from a heart that grumbles. You see, when we complain about our circumstance, we are essentially complaining against God's providence. Complaining is even contagious. You get too many complainers in one room, that's how you get coronavirus, actually. (laughs) See, God knows what we need, when we need it, how we need it. And the only thing you need to know is that God knows what you need. That's all you need to know. Trying to figure out how this is gonna play out, not going your way, the cards that were dealt, and you complain and God's like, you're complaining against what I've allowed and my providence. I am a good father. I am a perfect provider. Stop complaining, start praising, start worshiping, start trusting. Right, of course, the next part of verse 16 kind of, tells us the grumbling and the complaining is a result of how they're walking. How they're speaking is a result of how they're walking. Walking, obviously, in Scripture is always a term that designates practice, constant and continual. They're walking according to their own lusts, lusts being a strong, unhealthy desire, something that pulls you. Now we're all wrapped in sinful flesh, the nature of, of Adam that we've adopted, we've inherited. And that nature, like a magnet, pulls me to the things of the world. And the only thing that can sever that magnetic, sinful nature is the Holy Spirit or word of God is living in power and sharper than two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit joints and marrow, discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God, search me so that I'm not walking according to my lusts like these apostates. James chapter 1, 14, 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Each individual, prior to that, God doesn't tempt anyone. Each one of us are drawn away based on our desires, this lust, this unhealthy attraction. Then when the desire conceives, moms know what this means, it gives birth to, here comes the sin. And sin, when it is full grown because you fed it, it leads to death. The flesh that lusts, when I don't, sever that with leaning into the word or allowing the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can do, it gives birth to sin. And when sin grows, it eventually brings death. How does this play out? Well, the apostates are walking according to their lust. So out of the mouth, they're speaking their heart, which is grumbling and complaining. And here, the check for the believer is that we would be mindful of this lustful nature Right, Psalm chapter one is kind of a a pretty awesome text when you consider 
what I believe to be the progression here. Okay, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor seats, sits in the seat of mockery or the scorned. And I've always looked at and went, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty phenomenal because there's this negative progression taking place. The man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, bad advice, bad advisors, bad counsel, taking from the world's voices and the narratives as opposed to the Lord's voice and his narrative. When you're walking in that type of ungodly counsel, you will then get comfortable with it and you will stand. And now you're standing in the path of sinners. And the more you spend standing, it's inevitable that the standing leads to now I'm sitting. Now I'm in the seat of mockery. And what I've sown, I've grown. And now I'm entangled. In, let me kind of get more practical for you. First, I'm scrolling. Now I'm stopping. Now I'm clicking. Am I talking to anybody in here? First, I'm walking with a coworker. Now I'm standing at their desk. Now I'm sitting on a bed. You, you understand how this goes? The sin nature, if it's not dealt with by the spirit and by truth, it will take you further than you ever wanted to stray. It will keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And I know from experience, it will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. Okay, transition, if you will, this same idea of walking according to their own lust, the reason why these types of apostates mainly are teachers within the apostate church, they teach out of their lust, so their messages are always attracted to the flesh. And the reason why people come from all over, the masses will sit in a sanctuary where that type of preacher or teacher is appealing to not their spirit, it's their flesh. Of course I wanna be happy. Of course I wanna be healthy. Of course I wanna be wealthy. I want more of that message so people come back and they put up with lies that are coming camouflaged as truth and the church decays from the inside out. It becomes stale, it becomes about performance and entertainment, it becomes a social club, as opposed to an assembly of believers who are being purified through worship and praise, through the administration of God's word. See, their teachings, you can spot it. Their teachings tickle the flesh and the people receiving it, they wanna go for the itch. And I want more of that. Versus, or conversely, teaching that scratches the soul, which leads me to want to find a fix. Like, oh, that hurt, and I need the solution. And the only one that has the solution or the remedy is Christ. So I draw into him, not a man. Here's the progression again, I see it. They're walking according to their first lust. When the first lust isn't dealt with and it leads to a second look, it won't be long before the third down has you out. The first lust, second look, third down, out. That's a sports analogy. And the quickest way to get lost is to follow your own lust. You wanna be spiritually lost? Follow that unhealthy desire. Go for the itch. And eventually, the scratch, and eventually, the shackles. I'm studying in Luke 15 because I was preaching at a revival event last night, and the Lord brought me to Luke 15, so I spent a little bit of time teasing out the parable of, we call it the prodigal son. I think more appropriately, it should be the parable of the two lost sons, because while the story does focus on a younger son, it also has great emphasis, in fact, the emphasis on the older son. The whole purpose of, now I'm, I'm, I'm actually 
completely away from my notes right now. The whole purpose of the parable is Jesus is making a point to the religious mentality that was grumbling and complaining at the fact that he was sitting with sinners and tax collectors who were drawing near to him to hear him, and here they come drawing near to him to complain about him. You wanna complain, he says? And he breaks out into a parable. One parable, three verses. It's like one song with three verses. And the first is the shepherd who leads the 99 to go get the one. And when the shepherd comes back with the one, there's a celebration and he goes, just like in heaven, there's more celebration over one lost sinner who repents than 99 just people who do not need to repent. Then he moves his way to a woman who loses a jewel or a stone on a necklace and she overthrows her furniture. She scours through her house until she finds that one valuable piece to her necklace. And she calls her neighbors and says, I found it. And they have a party. And she's like, you getting the point yet? And then he makes his way to this part of the parable that deals with two sons. So I'm in that, taught it last night. And then I'm finishing my notes early this morning. And I'm like, wow, the younger son he got lost because he followed his lust. His first lust was, Dad, give me what is entitled to me. And he, want, he wanted what the father had in possessions as opposed to wanting the father as a person. And I'm like, look at us. We want what God gives us, and we don't necessarily with the same energy want God. Because if he doesn't meet my needs the way I think he should meet my needs, I grumble, I complain, I walk according to my own lust. I end up lost. I come back to the father like the younger son. He takes what the father gave him. He goes out into the way of the world. He spends it prodigally. That's where we get the word, wastefully. He comes up empty in his pockets. Everybody that was surrounding him and partying with him probably goes, you got nothing left. I'm not gonna hang out with you anymore. He joins himself to a citizen of that country. Now he's a prisoner to the way of the world. He's got nothing. He's down and out. He's in a pig pen. He's feeding pigs. He would have gladly filled his stomach with their pods, but he couldn't because they're not edible to a human. And he goes, you know what? How in the world did I get here? Does anybody know that feeling? Does anybody have any idea what that feels like? To be so lost and so broken. And there's two ways to go. You lean into your lostness, you stay in your brokenness, or you go, I think it's time to come home. I think it's time to come back to the Father's house. And what do we find? We find a God who is typified by the Father in the story, who receives his boy with arms wide open, total restoration, and in that, I see the opposite of walking in our lust, taking a second look, leading to third down, I'm out. My lust has led me to be lost, to walking according to my first love, coming back to my first love, coming back to Jesus, coming back to that love and passion you had when you first met him and when he first found you and all you did was come to the conclusion that you were lost and Christ did the rest of the work. You walk according to your first love. You take your second look, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith and that leads you to being safe on third base and you're almost home. That's how this works. Walk according to your first love. These grumblers, these complainers walking according to their lust. Now here we get a picture of the types of words that they speak. They, they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. It's interesting. They mouth great words that are empty. That's what the word swelling means. Words that are shallow. They might sound good, but they're empty on the inside. It says they flatter people to gain advantage. Put together verse 16, there's a lot here. They're vocally discontented, they're sinfully self-centered, they're extravagantly egotistical, and they're deceptively flattering. Such are apostates then, such are apostates now. They mouth great swelling words. We could use the word pompous to express 
their style of communication. Pomp. Might be accurate theologically, but within it, there's always an aim to flatter to their own gain. James chapter two, verses one through nine, it talks about, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Did you ever know what that meant? Like, the faith that we have as believers in Christ, there's not supposed to be any partiality within it. And then he gives an example. He's like, if a man coming dressed in fine clothing, he's got his jewelry, if he comes to this church right now, and a man who is dressed in rags, he comes in this church right now, which one is gonna be favored by your church leadership? The rich man is gonna be ushered to the front row. Here's our best seats. The poor man, we don't know if we have a seat for you right now. You can stand back there. We'll get to you when we get to you. Like James gives a real case study. Why? Because there was a problem with the sin of partiality. Because we look at the external or we look at the resources of an individual and we esteem them greater than somebody who doesn't have as much. And that's a sin. And these types of spiritual leaders, they will look around in a fellowship and find those with means and they will be friendly with those with means and they will butter those people up and they will flatter those people to gain their own advantage. Proverbs 29 verse five, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. A man who flatters his neighbor is actually setting him up for failure. Why? You keep telling me I'm awesome, I'm gonna start thinking I'm awesome. You keep telling me what I wanna hear, I'm going to get caught up in the snare of that deception. The interesting word here is flatters. It's in the Proverbs, in Hebrew, it's in Jude, in Greek. In the original etymology of the word flattery, it's related to the word flat. And I love it because the Greek and the Hebrew also often have these imageries that help drive the meaning. A man who flatters with his words or with his actions is like one who strokes with the flat of his hand somebody's hair. You ever seen somebody do that before? Stroking somebody's hair, telling them what they wanna hear. This is the type of spiritual liar in the church that causes division because people follow a man. And that's why the masses are often moved more by charisma than character. Right? Does anybody else hear music right now? Or is like my conscience going crazy? <laughs> I don't know, I'm just saying. I'm like, what is that, Lord? Is that the harps of heaven? Did, did the rapture just happen? Is that the elevator music? What was that? I'm like tripping out right now. Was that Showtime at the Apollo? You ever watched that show? <laughs> I'm almost done. Okay, what is character? Character is the sum of your attitudes and your actions. The sum of your character is made up of the attitudes and the actions of a believer or lack thereof. Interestingly, Gifts and talents and charisma can take you places. A gift can get you somewhere, but only character can keep you there. My gift got me somewhere in life, but because I lacked the character while I was there, I lost it. So the Lord had to put me at rock bottom to begin to build the character back within me. Because all those fractures and all those pieces in my character that were filled with the world, they needed to be purged. They needed to be removed. I needed to be, like you, subjected to the crucible. And it's within that crucible where the metal becomes pure. And what was within the metal, the impurities, they are melted off and it rises to the surface. So it's a good thing to see the things that are coming out of you that are not like God, 
but the honesty of assessing them when they come out of you, even a word that you know you shouldn't have said. When it comes out of you, a lot of times we don't even recognize it. I always tell people that are new in their faith and they're trying to correct how they speak. And what happens is they come to the Lord and they think like everything is going to be completely transformed overnight and they actually slip up and they say a couple curse words and then they beat themselves up. And I, I can't get my tongue in order. And they're like, I, I feel like I'm not even saved. And I'm like, calm down, brother, because last year or 10 years ago, did you even recognize what was coming out of your mouth? No. Yeah, so the fact that you are actually catching yourself from speaking how you shouldn't speak is an indication that there's a spirit inside of you that is working and transforming and purifying. So don't beat yourself up, just pick yourself up and keep moving forward. None of this is in my notes. What is happening right now? Okay, let's get to Jude 17 and 18. But you, Beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's kind of what he's saying were those words. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. It's almost a replication of what we just covered, but it also clues us in to how Jude is tethering his writing to the apostles. So I'm a, a Bible student. I go, Jude's mentioning Apostles of Jesus, remember those words that they spoke. Who are they? I don't have to go far. I'll bump into Peter's letter. Peter's letter was likely written before Jude's letter. So Jude's writing, and he's pointing people to Peter's letter. And in Peter's letter, you'll read this, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their lusts. Jude's like what Peter said, and Peter's like what the prophets said, and the prophets are like what the scriptures say, and what we're saying is we need to remember those words because we are scripturally forewarned so as to be spiritually forearmed. I mean, the repetition in the word is like, remember, stay grounded, stay guarded, put on the armor. Later on in that same chapter in 2 Peter, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, you've been forewarned, beware, be forearmed, lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have been scripturally forewarned, this book. It's telling us in advance of the times we're living in right now. And if we know that, we should be spiritually forearmed, prepared. Prepared by the ammunition of the word, protected by the armor of God. Why? Verse 19 is why. These are sensual persons. He's talking about people in the church. These are carnal people. And carnal people, when carnality exists, enmity remains. Enmity is to be at war with people and God. When carnality leads a decision, there will be confusion. These are sensual persons who cause divisions. How do they cause divisions? They don't have the spirit. He doesn't leave anyone guessing. These people don't have the Holy Spirit. Sensuality, right? Their senses are fleshly. They can never have spiritual sensitivity. So everything they do is dividing the spiritual body. They even might think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Here's the interesting thing. A lot of times apostasy, it comes in all forms. It can even come in one who thinks they have the spirit and they might think they have more spirit than you. And meanwhile, everything they do, they're bringing division and all the while it's because they don't have the spirit at all. Because the spirit, the true spirit, the Holy Spirit, 
brings people together under the banner of the gospel. Doesn't divide. Doesn't lead people away. That's why Romans, Paul would say, chapter 16, verse 17, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, remember, and avoid them. Note them, avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, their own appetite, their own desires, their lusts. And by, ready? Smooth words, flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. But you, beloved, Remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be like the Bereans, personally. Right? Acts 17, verse 11. When they first heard or memorized or knew, they searched. It says in Acts 17, 11, these were more noble-minded, fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, why? Why were they more noble-minded? In that they received the word with all readiness, willingness, and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. The Bereans, they had an appetite to search the scriptures on their own. You know what makes for a healthy body? Is when believers, members of that body, search the scriptures on their own and do not take what I'm saying as true. I want to be as close to truth as possible, but I'm a flawed man. You search the scriptures too. The reason why spiritual deception is at an all-time high is because believers, people, are not searching the scriptures on their own. So I can tell you anything. If I know you're not reading your Bible, I can get up here and tell you anything. And that's why those who avoid the scriptures are devoid of the spirit. You avoid the word of God. It's what these apostates did. It's why Judah's saying, remember what you've been told. Remember the words of the Lord. Remember the words of the apostles. Remember the words of the prophets. Remember that they said these times were coming, that mockers and scoffers would exist, that a great falling away would occur. But you, you stay close to truth. You keep feeding your spirit with truth. You keep walking in the spirit of truth and you are the ones with the ministry of truth. Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, when he, the Holy, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. You will be forewarned so you can be forearmed, so you can be prepared for the battle ahead. The Lord is purging his church, no doubt about it. He is refining his bride. He is preparing her for his return. He's looking for a people who are not coming to church to hear a message or a sermon. He's looking for a people who are coming to his church to hear his voice. He's looking for a people who care more about holiness than having a huge church attendance. He's looking for a people who care more about hope, true hope, over hype. He is looking for a people who are willing to stand on the truth of his word even when the whole world is pushing you away from it. He's looking for based on the acts or actions of the apostles as laid out in the book of Acts, he's looking for a people who will, who will yield themselves to the Holy Spirit, finally, fully. He's looking for believers who are so focused on Christ and the cross that like Paul, I've determined not to know anything else among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's looking for a people who keep their eyes fixed on Christ, the author and finisher of their faith. 
He's looking for people who understand this is not a pep rally on a Thursday or a Sunday. He's looking for people who come to this place that we can be refined by the worship and the praise and the administration of his word so that we can be more like Jesus. He's looking for a people who beyond a building are living for his glory, walking in a manner worthy of our calling. He's looking for younger sons who are broken, who have a testimony that I've come home to the father and found his arms wide open. He's looking for that younger brother mentality to look at the older brother mentality and say, you're not saved based on your good works or your morality or the fact that you never broke the law. He's looking for a people who are willing to stand alone with Jesus. Amen. And if that music starts playing again, I'm ending the sermon. I'm going to end the sermon anyway. And Lord willing, we'll be back at this. Hey, there's some exciting, positive imperatives on the horizon here. I know we've been at some of the darker areas of identifying the apostates, and there's been a lot of color commentary around what type of behavior they have, what types of words they speak. Right around the corner, Judah's about to give us some positive imperatives. He's about to tell us, hey, this is what you do. In light of what I just told you, here's what I need you to do. So those are the days ahead, Lord willing, when we come back together, let me pray over this fellowship. And you know what? Let's sing a thousand hallelujahs. I don't know if there's a thousand hallelujahs in the song, but that's what it's called. So we're gonna do that together. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we ask for your Holy Spirit to begin to fall in a fresh and real way. Fall upon our souls, begin to purify, begin to refine, begin to work things out. Take anything out of our lives that is not like you. Make us more like Jesus. We commit and submit our lives to the potter's wheel, trusting your hands to form and fashion. God, remove any spirit of complaining or grumbling, anything within our hearts where we second guess or doubt your providence. Give us hearts and tongues of praise that when we sing hallelujah, our lives would follow and live in light of that praise because that's what you deserve. That is what you desire. Thank you for this body of believers. Thank you that we can come together, find healing and fellowship, peace in the midst of confusion, So you know what we do, God? We give you back your church for your leadership, for your instructions, for your governance. We get out of the way. Bring repentance back to this fellowship. Break us, God, from the inside out. Deal with any sin in our lives. Search our hearts. Anything, God, is that's keeping us from knowing you and seeing you, just begin to remove it all. Bring this body of believers to a posture and a position where we're no longer playing church, but we want all of you. We want to live in light of your glory. Bring families back to the cross, husbands and wives, God, to be centered on your son, Jesus. Make us more prayerful. I know personally it's easy for me to talk about the issues and the problems that I see. But God, remind me to shut up and start praying. Bring weeping back to your house. Tears that should fall from our eyes in light of how we've sinned against you.
Bring revival back to the souls of your people that we would actually have an appetite to be in your presence. Allow us to be crushed under the weight of your holiness. So this moment, God, we're gonna praise you. We're gonna sing you do glory. And we're gonna trust you for the outcome. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.